and I welcome. I'm going to introduce myself. This was so different. Um, actually, preparing a science talk as opposed to a departmental meeting, a faculty meeting, or meeting with the deans or something like this. And so I've had fun the last couple of days. The original idea was to plan something new, but I didn't have time. So I relied on, I'll just do the talk I gave three years ago as part of the uh, uh, distinguished lecture um, through the ocean drilling program. And then I went on a walk last night and a walk this morning and decided I needed to change some things up. So there will be a hiccup or two, but those are the good hiccups or twos. That means I'm thinking it through in real time. And I will, so I'm Jim Wright. I'm the chair, and you all know me, uh, for those who are just watching. Um, I'll introduce myself. I um, went to Columbia University a, a few years ago and got my PhD after a master's in South Carolina and undergraduate at Louisiana Tech in geology. Um, I stayed on at Lamont for a few years working in deep water circulation and um, went to the University of Maine for four years where I was an assistant professor. Um, and um, then four years into that job, the position at Rutgers uh, opened up um, and I applied and uh, came here in 1998. I started with Dennis Kent and Paul Falkowski, both of whom got into the National Academy of Sciences. I'm still waiting for the phone to ring, but <clears throat> I won't be holding my breath. And I've been here um, now for 24 years, starting my 25th. Do I get anything, Ken, for 25? Probably nothing. Uh, but um, uh, I've been here. I've been graduate program director and now in my second year as chair. And I know everybody by first name, and most of you are on my cell phone except for Lev, and we'll have to do that. You will get a uh, shout out today, so uh, just uh, be ready for it. Um, and um, today is um, a talk that builds on a cruise that I went on in 19, uh, 19, 2019. Um, and I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, share desktop. And But as I will um, get to, um, the point of my talk um, for the Ocean Discovery uh, lecture series was um, linking four ODP cruises that I went on, and the first one starting in 1996 to the Bahamas, and then to the North Atlantic, and then to the Maldives, and then hopefully to the Argentine margin. Um, I'm going to cut out the surface water. Sorry, Mark. Um, I had three talks and one, so one and a half had to get cut. And I'm going to focus in on the Argentine margin today and where I would like to be drilling. Uh, but there are linkages and <clears throat> to all four of those cruises, and the conclusions I make today about what we see on the Argentine margin actually can be seen in the deep North Atlantic, the Maldives, and the Bahamas telling us that the ocean circulation system was linked. When something happens in one place, we can see a similar response in another place. So the talk outline, I just, well, one of those slides I should have updated, but we'll do the first two of these, and I call it how I got to now, this particular point in my career, and it involves things I did in my PhD. I will show my first PhD chapter, chapter one, just one figure because it becomes important in what I want to do. And then I'll try to put it all together in a coherent fashion, hopefully in about 45 minutes. So, 
modern cir circulation, there's two main components in modern circulation where the currents are strong enough that you can actually see them um, um, carving their way through the bottom, reshaping the bottom, producing something called contour rights or drift sediments. And one of them is in the tropics, and this Anya is very interested in this, in the Miocene, and she's interested in this particular area of the uh, ocean, uh, the eastern equatorial Pacific. The other one is, I should get my currents going the right way, the other one is this uh, westerly, the west wind drift or the cir Antarctic circumpolar current, and it flows, and it's w the strongest current on the er uh, in the modern ocean, with 200 sphere drops of water flowing at any one particular time. And I would ask, quiz you guys what a sphere drop is, but I don't have time. So there is a link in intensity on the geologic record, and one of the things we will see is, if I have time, that when this spins up, we also see a spin up in the tropics. So my tools, and this was a, a magnificent sunrise um, looking um, to the east, uh, just north of the Maldives. I, Jose probably remembers it. It was so much more spectacular in person than what you see, but he was night crew with me, and that meant that we got a lot of sunrises. Mark was the day shift, and he got all the sunsets. But um, spectacular images uh, each morning down there. Um, so I'm a stable isotope geochemist. That's my hammer. I apply it to every geological problem I can find, except for in this case, I'm going to use seismics as one of my primary tools and then go back to stable isotopes. And I'll just tell you how to interpret them. You won't have to be a ge stable isotope geochemist to interpret these. But um, the Delo 18 proxy Ken uses, we, Anya uses, uh, we analyze it in my lab, Mark uses it, um, and it's a good proxy for temperature and ice volume. We measure it in something called foraminifera. Um, Maya has done a lot of those analyses in the lab for other people. Hopefully in the next month or two, November 7th, uh, 2nd we're going. Um, we, we, we can make those measurements and estimates in our lab. Uh, the other thing we do is Delta C13, carbon isotopes, good proxy for uh, deep water masses, and that too is something Anya uses in her work. Um, I will, um, and they can tell us proximity to deep water sources. They could tell us if a gateway, the Drake Passage in particular, was open. In other words, if it's open, you would see similarities in proxies. If it's closed, you might see differences in proxies. And the two gateways that I'm interested in will be the Caribbean and the Drake Passage. Um, then, much of the talk will be looking at seismic reflection profiles. Um, and here we put a pulse of energy into the water and it goes down and it will reflect off the bottom and uh, give us some indication of what's below the surface of the sea floor. So high resolution seismics. It's kind of like biopsies and CAT scans if you're familiar with, well we're all familiar with the medical word world. The CT scans or x-rays give us some indication of what's below the surface, what's inside. We don't know exactly always. We can make an educated guess. If we can biopsy what's inside, we can get a, know exactly what's below the surface. And so we use one to make educated guess. We use the other to ground truth and tell us exactly what lies below the sea floor. So on a ship, in marine geology, we will use multi-channel seismics. I'll go into that ever so briefly. And what we have here, we're standing on the fantail, the aft or back portion of a ship. And we have streamers that are, 
uh, with hydrophones in them. They are spaced 6.25 uh, meters apart. And this streamer is 900 meters long. We tow it behind the ship. Um, we get the signals inside, and this is the ground central for uh, getting the seismic data. Jose, Mark, um, and others sat patiently two hours a day looking at these screens, making sure or making sure that data were being collected, that the guns were firing and data were being collected. The other half, and this is from the ocean drilling program right in here. Uh, this is, um, oh gosh. Oh, well, don't worry. Uh, but these are ocean drilling cores coming in. They come in at a little over 10 meters. They're cut. Anya was on the JR and collected these cores, as did Mark. They're cut into one and a half meter sections right in here. And so here are our biopsies. And I'll just go through this. We have a sound source, compressed air, sends out a pulse, a bubble pulse, and our streamer behind will collect the reflections off the seafloor and also discontinuities deep within the sediments. We did have whale watchers on our cruise and whenever we saw a marine mammal, we had to stop for 30 minutes and Right here, you can see we saw three dolphins or whales. They kept coming in and out, probably the day shift, but uh, um, they saw much more marine life than we did. Um, deep sea sediment drifts, we're still in the introduction. This is where the ocean uh, currents, the deep currents, interact with the sea floor, and if you have a high enough sediment supply, you can build some pretty spectacular um, deep sea sedimentary features. And if they are, well, I'll show you a couple. Depending on your tool, your source, you can see quite deep. We will look at some seismic records that can see two to three, four kilometers deep within the sediments. The Germans did that, and you get quite the record. We'll be looking at records that can see about a kilometer into the sediments. And Jose uh, has some parasound data that gives you some spectacularly high resolution uh, record but it only penetrates 50 to 100 meters deep in the sediment. So high so it's a trade-off. If you look deep, you can't resolve fine features. If you look at fine features, you can't uh, penetrate very deeply. So we're in the sweet spot. We like to recover uh, sediments anywhere from 400 meters, maybe to 800 meters. So this multi-channel uh, high resolution multi-channel system is exactly what we needed on this cruise. So this is a picture I borrowed from Robesco and Taviani and a deep sea sediment drift you have bottom currents in this case flowing to the north and it will hug the continental rise or slope and any sediments that come down will be thrown over the uh, drift axis and collect on the side. Often you get a lot of erosion in this area and sedimentation in this particular area. The average deep sea sediment mark is how much? One centimeter per thousand. We get on average 10 centimeters per thousand up to, well Yair's not here, but they're getting meters per thousand in some, in some locations. And here's just an example on the, from the Iberian margin of this cartoon actually is based on real data. Now, still in the introduction, let's throw one more tool at you, but this is to introduce the deep water masses um, that we see um, in the ocean, the major ones today. And so here's Antarctica, here's the uh, Antarctic circumpolar current flowing around here. 
and we have a cut out of the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and the Atlantic Ocean right in here. And what you're seeing is contoured Delta C13 values of the ocean. You don't need to worry about those except for they are kind of a tracer for deep water masses. The North Atlantic um, has high values shown in red, about one per mil. The Pacific has low values averaging about one, zero per mil, even though the range is plus 0.4 to minus 0.8, almost minus one per mil. Uh, so they're lower. And the Antarctic circumpolar current takes high values and low values and spin them around. And the Southern Ocean has a mixture in about 0.4, 0.5 per mil. The low from the Pacific, the high from the North Atlantic. If you turned off North Atlantic deep water, theoretically it would, um, the everywhere the values would generally converge, even though there'd be gradients in each ocean. So this is through time, but I just want to make the point that over the time discussed in this talk, oh, I lost the age, but from 25, 25 to zero, uh, oh, nine million to zero, here is 20 something to zero. We see North Atlantic always has the highest records, the Pacific always has the lowest records, and the Southern Ocean from about eight million years ago to the present um, is somewhere in between. So our general assumption that the Atlantic is high, Pacific is low, and the rest of the world is in between holds generally well for the last 15 million years. I'm going to change that. I'm going to say it's for the last eight, but that's a little bit later in the talk. The last primer, and maybe I should ask Mark to give this talk, but I'm not. So what we have is the last 66 million years of Delta 18. I think this is from Ken's 20... 1819 paper. I don't know. It's a benthic foraminiferal census, uh, our, our, our stack. And what we have is you don't need to know how to interpret exactly what these values mean, but warmer and less ice with low delta 18 values, colder and more ice with um, higher delta 18 values. So Early in the Cenozoic, the first half of the Cenozoic, we were generally warm. The Eocene climate optimum, there were alligators on Ellesmere Island here, 78 degrees, 80 degrees north. Sequoia trees, the California redwoods for uh, Caitlin, picture that. That was Ellesmere, Axel Highbird, the Canadian archipelago looked like the redwoods. It was warm up there. Then we go through a long-term cooling, um, and then we develop an uh, Antarctic ice sheet that now grows to the edge of the continent. We're getting ice rafted detritus, rocks, pebbles, boulders being dropped out into the open ocean. Then we go through a, a kind of quasi-time into the middle Miocene, Anya's interest, um, and we have a paper in revision um, looking at the middle Miocene climate optimum. The values suggest that we were largely ice-free, if not completely ice-free then. Uh, the world was five to seven degrees warmer than it is now. We go into a, a, a pretty abrupt cooling over two million years. We grow the Antarctic sheet back out to its current position, and it's largely stayed that way. Um, um, very, very large, very, very cold, driving circumpolar circulation. The, it doesn't show up so well right in here, but there is an early Pliocene climatic, climatic optimum. And then finally, the development of large-scale northern hemisphere ice sheets that had a 40,000-year beat at first and then got a 100,000 beat a little bit later on. That's your climate primer for today. Now let's get into the talk. Oh, 
Well, I just went through this. My saying climate optimum. Why was it so warm? And it was pretty abruptly. This was less than a precessional cycle. So less than 20,000 years it warmed three or four degrees. Boom, it shot up. This is the shout out to Lev, James, and Ben if he's there. Why was it warm? It could be the Columbia River flood basalts. Um, and the basalts are dated as 16.8 and younger, although there's some 17 ones. But what Ben has shown is the volatile degassing tends to precede the major lava flows. And so the major lava flows, and Caitlin's probably driven through them, Chris may have as well, are 16.5 and younger, and yet the warming occurred very precisely at 17 million years ago and very abruptly. So this may be Ben's mechanism of the volatiles coming out of the magmas much sooner than the, um, than the lava flows that seem to be about a half a million years later. I'm going to throw in the Snefeles, which I just said incorrectly. It's Northwest Island. It's uh, the lava start at 16.4 to 16 million years ago. It's the Northwest section of Iceland. And I'm going to throw that out there because one of the things is we have a two million year long climate optimum. How do you do it if the volatiles come out at 17? Maybe we need a secondary push and it could be coming from Iceland. So now let's get to the talk. So three years ago at this time, I was on a ship. We were collecting seismic data, wondering when we were going to core. We were getting to know each other, um, um, playing a lot of ping pong, lots of other things, because seismic, as long as it's doing well, there's just not a lot to do except for to make sure that it's doing well. And, um, so we collected a lot of data. We went from Montevideo, Uruguay, not Buenos Aires, um, uh, but Montevideo, and worked uh, just north of the Malvinas, or Falklands as you may know it. Um, in this box right in here, we did multicores, we did CTs. We, here's a picture of a multicore with a bryozoan in it. It goes down and sets down softly and will collect only 10 centimeters, but you get this uh, uh, seafloor um, bottom intact. Um, some of our coring mechanisms are just dropping uh, two tons of pipe into the sediments and it tends to, to get deeper, tends to blow off the top. We did have weather. I'm not gonna play this, Mark. Well, maybe I should. Let's see if it plays. Don't listen. Oh! All right. <laughs> we ended the cruise like this. Perfect weather. Um, it was only the last week. So you're out 51 days. You get weather like uh, we showed. It looked like this. All right. So now let's get into the Patagonian margin. Um, Jose um, has worked on this on his dissertation. We have four terraces from the Nahara, which is the continental shelf. It's very shallow, less than 400 meters. It's very hard. Seismics could barely penetrate through it. it is, um, there is a, an escarpment there, and it steps down to the Perito Moreno shelf. Another escarpment that steps down to the Piedra Buena, and then another escarpment that steps down to the Valentin Fieldberg. I think these two are erosional or erosive um, in, um, right in here. Antarctic intermediate water is cutting away. Upper circumpolar deep water is cutting away right in here. These are old relic surfaces, quite hard, Miocene and older, Eocene in some cases. These two uh, uh, um, uh, terraces are constructional. You'll hear more about Piedra Buena. You did with Tim's. Maya may be working on Piedra Buena, but I'm going to look at the Valentin Fieldberg today, and we'll go through that. So 
Here are the terraces and topography. Um, and we're going to look at a seismic line that is shown somewhere right around where that red line is. And these are streamlines showing you how all the Antarctic circumpolar waters come around uh, the Malvinas Islands and they blast right into this area before turning to the north. And we'll look at that area. Here's some high resolution topography, uh, seafloor topography shown by um, Jose. And what you see is it's kind of rough, um, rough in here. And what you see is a seismic line with a big drift. This seismic line in here is quite erosive with only patches of modern sedimentation. And this one's a hybrid. It's got lots of erosion with Miocene um, 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 outcrops right in here with a little bit of modern sedimentation that is protected a little bit by this embayment right in here. And so here's a close up on that and it sh highlights two things. Uh, one is this, this is a smooth topography. The sediments are delivered via canyons. Sediments come to the margin. Tim showed that they sit there in high stands and get whooshed down these canyons during low stands and they build um, up in the north. To the south, we get lots and lots of erosion with only patchy uh, modern sedimentation. And much of that can be Miocene age sediments that are at the surface. Um, this is Jose um, pulling a core, but this is the high resolution parasound data. And this black line right in, well, new battery, but black line right in here, we see that in all of our cores. So this is a Patagonian wide event where in the middle of all this nice, warm, chalky um, uh, foram nano ooze, we get a down, um, a current downslope transport event and we see, we see that but you can see the high resolution my seismics can barely resolve any of what the beautiful stuff that Jose shows here and here's a couple of more very very spectacular recording multiple climate events in there and then so this is what we see, and this is Aaron Waters, who um, is on leave from the program right now. He uh, did a lot of the um, seismic processing, and this is the seismic line, well, give up on this, seismic line that um, is common um, uh, throughout. It's our benchmark line. We're coming from the Pied uh, Piedra Buena down into a moat and into the Valentin Fieldberg. And you can see we saw one dolphin or whale during that one. If we go to the north, you can see the Piedra Buena, the moat. At some point in the past, it was building up, but it is very, very different. We'll look at these, lots of accumulation in the past, erosion, more accumulation, and now current erosion going on. So parts of this drift are constructional, parts of it are erosive, it's cannibalizing itself because there's not enough sediments and that's a different story that we'll talk about some other day but not today. So here's the German line, I told you it can see about four seconds or three kilometers into, maybe a little bit more into the sediments. And you can see the major morphology and we're going to be looking at this drift uh, right in here and it is this um, AR6 and above and there's two features, one, uh, two segments identified. One is this early drift accumulation in this area right in here and then it, uh, there's a shift at some point in the past where most of the accumulation has moved to the east on this seismic line. Aaron once again and what I'm going to show is something I showed a couple of years ago in the summer presentation is the last seismic line we looked at they've already identified all of the seismic reflectors we're going to project them onto uh, an oblique line because there's a saddle in this area which is a sediment 
repository is going to give us a better preserved section of sediments. At least that's my hope. So here's the original seismic line and unfortunately one of the things I could not do is find the one with the VF5 reflector identified for some reason. Um, I can't find it but it is there and it is where um, um, Jens Grutzner and Javier Molina, uh, Hernandez Molina have identified. I don't like where they put AR7 and I'll show you why in a minute with a close-up. I'm going to identify an AR7 prime um, because I think that's when the major change occurred. Like I said, we just transferred their seismic um, uh, uh, interpretations to our lines, so we're not changing their interpretations, we're using their interpretations. So this is the oblique line, and this is exactly where they um, put their seismic reflectors. I've just added the AR7 prime, and there seems to be a little bit of a pattern going on in there. So what I did was digitize this seismic uh, record, and looked at it there and then this is in two-way travel time so I just did a spectral analysis quick and dirty on it and it comes out to 0 0.033 seconds if you flip that over um, it comes out to one of those um, periods or, or cycles is about every 25 meters in the sediments all right so we have a cyclicity in the sediments every 25 meters. So, this is where I'm talking to two people in the room right now. I'll put it, three people, Catherine just walked in. Um, maybe Lev has some interest. Oh, Paul has some interest as well. So, why do we have um, cycles? And it has to do with having planets. Without planets in our solar system, we would be completely circular orbit around and we would still be tilted, but we wouldn't have the wobbles and other things that we have in there. So we have three climate cycles that we look at, um, unless you're me and I look at 40 days and 40 nights, but that's an internal joke with Ken. Um, but we look at eccentricity and it goes from almost zero, perfectly circular to about 6%. This is pretty gross eccentricity is not that bad um, where you have obliquity which is 40,000 years and 1.1 million years and then we have precession so one of these could possibly be controlling this um, cycles that we see in our seismic records so what I did was looking at several seismic lines, counted down to the cycles, just physically counted down the cycles to each of those seismic reflections that they identified other than AR prime, AR7 prime. And that's in the left column right in here. And then here's the cumulative. And if one of those cycles is actually, if these are actually periodic and a climate driven cycle, we can make predictions of the ages. So if it's the 400,000 year, cycle we have this column for each of those reflectors if it's if it's the 1.1 million year cycle or if it's the 100,000 year cycle we have these ages so forth and so on the sedimentation rates the average sedimentation rates would be in meters per million or centimeters per thousand depending on who you like um, the one that is probably the mo the best would be either this 10 centimeters or this three and a half centimeters per thousand. The others I can't rule out, but those are the most obvious. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to assume it's the 400,000 year eccentricity. So here's our seismic line, and I'll just step you through the history of deep uh, Antarctic circumpolar circulation as it's influenced the Patagonian margin using these reflectors. Based on other people's work and their interpretation of the seismics, AR6 is when we begin to see current controlled deposition at the base of the Valentin field bird, about 14. Anya, what happened at 14? 
Yeah, we started growing the East Antarctic ice sheet. So it's starting to get cold. We're coming out of the climate optimum. So maybe we're spinning up the wind. So that kind of makes sense. What I see is the major phase of drift accumulation, and that is shown in this blob right in here, really took off closer to 13 or 12 and a half million years ago. And that's from VF1 to VF2. The next major shift, they put it at AR7, which would be 8.5. I've looked very, very closely, and you can see that the shift actually occurs where I call AR7 right there and not at AR, AR7 prime and not AR7. So that's, to me, there's an eastward shift. Uh, you go from accumulating here to accumulating to the east, this part of the drift right here. And that would be dated at 7.7, .7, if my 400,000 year assumption is correct for those cycles. The next one up, whoops, next one up is um, another change which I'm going to highlight in just a minute. <clears throat> this just is, this is where audience, anybody know what boundary that's close to other than Ken stratigraphic commission guy time scale people anybody been to the med and seen the white oh, okay well this is the Miocene Pliocene boundary I'm not <clears throat> exactly sure why there's a big discontinuity although I'm going to make a guess and then finally the interpretation that is not there VF5 and it, it flows right along there, right along there. That's two, two and a half million. Now, I could fudge this. I mean, the cycles are there. Some cases I counted a half a cycle, but this could be 2.6, this could be 2.2. I just went with 2.4 because that's what my cycle count gave me. I wasn't trying to resolve it. I would probably choose 2.6 if I had to, but we'll leave it right there. So let's look at this area uh, in the box a little bit more detail. And it's because of these two acoustic, um, uh, acoustic zones. So boom, boom. We, we can trace the reflectors up into this area right in here where we lose the reflectors. And the same thing in this one right in here. We see reflectors going into it, but they disappear right in here. And here's my dog walking, um, why I change, because I'm going to start waving my hands mightily and try to get other people interested in testing a hypothesis. So one of the acoustic zones starts at 7.7 .7 and disappears or changes at 5.3. The other one starts at um, 2.4 and continues as far as we can tell to the present. So what are the hypotheses for what produced it? One could be that these are current co controlled features and we're just pinching out that we can no longer resolve them with our seismic line. Jose could see them if he could penetrate that deeply, but he can't. They're just too small. We lose them because our seismic wave is bigger than what the features are. The other ones are that these are chaotic, unorganized, and there's no sedimentary features to um, pull out with our seismic tool. And the third one would be, could this just be gas collecting at the northern edge of the wedge, which would hide or obliterate um, the seismic imaging that we are. I'm going to go with number two just for the sake of time. So let's start at seven and a half million years ago, this surface right in here. And we probably had a current axis that was anchored in the moat, which is just off the screen. I realized about an hour ago that I cut too much, but it was too late. So the current axis is probably here, but it's going to shift. And so this is the wedge between 7.7 .7 and 5.3. We probably had a current axis that moved up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And it would 
kind of chew up any of the sediments. It may be erosive in some cases. It may be just mildly disturbing in other cases. Stepping up another one in time, we don't see the transparent zone. This would be 5.3 to 2.5 million years ago. And what I'm interpreting is that this is a time of climate stability, that the deep water axis was relatively anchored. It did not move up in town. We get a lot of accumulation right in here, but we don't see the transparent zone. There could be, and I can't, um, I've looked at the seismics, you can't really tell what's going on up here. It could be that this is where the erosion and the transparent zone is but the record's not there, or at least is not there in a way that you can interpret. And then finally, you get another uh, sequence, the VF5 to present, where the current axis is moving up and down and chewing up this transparent zone right in here. So what's the uh, story up to now? The late Miocene, around seven and a half, eight million years ago, the current shifted from being hugged, hugging the um, slope, creating a moat, shifted to the east, and focused deposition, not next to the moat, but to the east on the deeper Valentine field bird. Um, other people have proposed that this is the entrance of North Atlantic deep water into the South Atlantic basins. I'll address that very quickly. And then um, I'm proposing that the transparent zone is a climatically driven modulation or up and down laterally, but it's moving vertically to uh, the current axis and it's just chewing up the bottom where it is. Um, there was a stabilization in the early Pliocene. We don't see the transparent zone. And then a resumption of this moving of the current axis in the last two and a half million years. Is this consistent with other records? And this is, I figure, I did many years ago, and it's coming back. Polar fronts. Well, Anya sees diatoms and radiolarians in her. They occur where there's high upwelling, lots of nutrients. And we get the same thing at the polar front. And so um, what we see in um, our South Atlantic Basin is we're very near the polar front on the Patagonian margin. And so we actually see in Tim Seamus's master thesis, Jose's dissertation, you see the polar front moving. Sometimes there's diatoms, sometimes they're forams, nanos. So um, we can look at that and, um, or other people, Flip Froelich and Rick, if he's here, but maybe he's home today. Um, looked at that um, in the South Atlantic, and this is from Flip and Rick's work. And what we see starting eight million years ago, the red is biogenic calcite, the blue is biogenic silica, and we see starting around eight million years ago a decrease in the calcite, an increase in the biogenic silica, and you're seeing much higher frequency variations. Then we see a relative calm from about five and a half or 5.8 almost 6 million years ago to about 3 million years ago of low biogenic silica, high biogenic carbonate, and the cycles are much more muted. And then we see the increase in um, variability over the last 2.5 million years. If we compare their age model with our age model, we see relatively calm, relatively calm, high variability, high variability. And so it's beginning to make a little bit of sense. This hypothesis still needs to be tested. So deep water began to shape the Valentine Fieldberg 14 million years ago, really turned on around 13 million years ago. There was a shift at seven and a half million years ago. The transparent zones disappeared in the early Pliocene, marking stability and then they reappeared in the late um, Pliocene, Pleistocene, uh, marking much more variability. That's the story. Now, let's go back 30 years, and I will do it very, very quickly. 
Greg Mountain and I uh, went on a cruise. We surveyed the Gardar Bjorn drifts up in just south of Iceland and the Eric drift over in here. Um, and then I got on IODP Expedition 303. I'm not going to show those results for the sake of time. That's a different talk. But what we see is the onset of North Atlantic deep water around 12 and a half, a blip uh, between 19 and 16 million years ago. The deep sea sediment drift show a parallel record with extremely high accumulation rates from three to five million years off of Greenland. So really high current controlled activity in the early Pliocene. This is my first chapter of my dissertation. I had to put it out there. Um, it's ugly. You know, it's where you have to photocopy, turn it into a PhD because that's how we did it. We typed it up, sent out camera ready, pasted in our figures, and, um, and that's how it is. But from this paper, Wright, Miller, and Fairbanks, uh, 1991, we proposed, in fact, the title is Evolution of Modern Deepwater Circulation Evidence from the Late Miocene Southern Ocean. And what we see is the North Atlantic record, the Pacific record, and we see beginning around eight million years ago, maybe seven and a half million years ago, the Southern Ocean diverging into what is very similar to what we see today. Prior to that, different talk, the gradients are smaller. There are times when we see um, 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 the three, North Atlantic, Southern Ocean, Pacific, but the amplitudes are much, much smaller. So the North Atlantic story turned on somewhere around 12 to 13. Uh, post 8 million years ago, we get the modern signatures, um, and I'm not going to deal with the drift. So. Lev, Ben, and James, I'm, I'm going, and Brent, if he's online. What is controlling North Atlantic deep water? Back in the 90s, well, actually back in the early 80s, and then Ken kind of proposed this, and I took it up in my dissertation in the 90s, is that the flow of deep water, which originates to the north, most of the densest waters are up in the Norwegian Greenland Sea and the Arctic. They flow over the Greenland Scotland Ridge, which is shown, which is here. And we have a mantle plume underneath Iceland right in here. And mantle plumes have activity and they go quiescent, and active and quiescent, active and quiescent. And so I took an idea that Peter Vogt proposed and continued it and so I give him credit even though it is I think um, someone called it the Wright Miller hypothesis um, but Peter Vogt probably de um, deserves most of the credit and what I've done was taken the seismic the bathymetry across the Reykjanes Ridge right in here and turned it into a proxy for mantle plume activity with the idea that if the mantle plume activity underneath Iceland is high, the whole system goes up. If the mantle plume activity uh, decreases, the whole system goes down, with this being the arms of the Greenland-Scotland Ridge. And this is turning it into that proxy from 20 to 15 million years ago. There was low mantle plume activity high mantle plume activity from 15 to 12 or 11 million years ago, some blips in the late Miocene, and then in the early Pliocene, the mantle plume activity really drops off according to the ridge morphology, and then around two and a half, three million years ago, it picks up. And that's what we see right in there. And then just using the modeling studies of Garrett Ito and assumed the plume activity in the here is the modern um, is shown in black right in here. The green is shown in the early Pleistocene and the red is shown there, just assuming it's a valve. So what's the story? And this is where Lev gets in. Let me go back to this. Volatiles come out when there's excessive volcanism. My excessive volcanism 
starts in this record at 15 million years ago and then slows down around 12 million years ago. Anya will tell you that it starts getting cold at 14.8 or 13.8 and 12. We're out of phase. The climate is out of phase with the record of lavas and the ridge morphology. Same thing happens here. The warmest interval is the early Pliocene and yet we have the lowest mantle plume activity as recorded by anomalous topography along the Reiki, Reiki, bathymetry along the Reikianus Ridge. Yet, when we get cold in the late Ply, uh, the Pleistocene, we have much more mantle plume activity. I'm out of phase yet once again, so you can't have anything. Along comes Ben, and maybe James, and maybe Lev, and we learn that the most volatiles come out of the system prior to the most magma coming out as lava. So there's an early release of volatiles followed by, on the order of a half a million years, the piling up of the lava. So it could be that this warm interval from 17 to 15, Columbia River flood basalts, I'm not discounting that, guys, but it could have been augmented by the Iceland mantle plume. And this warm interval in the early Pliocene could be augmented by mantle plume activity prior to the release of lava flows at that particular time. So the mantle plume, here's my conclusion, is a testable hypothesis. Ben, if you're out there, Brent, if you're out there, you guys, let's go to Iceland. We can go and sample the lavas and look for um, the volatile content throughout the Iceland lavas. We can date them with argon-argon and see if the volatile contents in these uh, magmas or in these crystals actually correlate with the prediction that I would make is that the Iceland mantle plume contributed to climate change in the early Pliocene, which we see in the North Atlantic and along the Argentine margin. And then the volatile outgassing decreased, the lavas flow, uh, uh, followed, but the climate deteriorated. And that's it. Brent, Ben, James. This is when I guess I ask myself if there's any questions. <laughs> Lauren. Um, so I'm guessing this is stuff that Maya's going to be working on before the first part of the seismics. Where do the core locations you have relate to what you showed? Um, the core locations don't necessarily, well on the Piedra Buena they do relate to where we went. Um, because it was so scoured, um, we went wherever the 3.5 kilohertz suggested there were sediments. And there's some sediments around 1,000 meters, 800 meters, so that actually might be pretty good for Antarctic intermediate water. Piedra Buena is loaded. Jose's dissertation, Tim's master's thesis. And then there's tons of sediments and tons of cores on the Valentin Fieldberg, the deep one. The problem is the one place that we've, the few samples we have, have no foraminifera in them. So there's nothing for me to burn up in acid and get stable isotopes or trace metals in Yair's lab or anything like that. We're hopeful that they will find others. Caitlin. The which one? The we tried. There's one, and our best guess is that the base of the core may touch it, but we may, we may or may not. We'll know November sometime between November second and tenth. There are your dates. <laughs> It is. Normally we would, Ken is a member of the Joides Resolution Facility Board. Normally, if we had had 4Ms, we would have submitted a 
full proposal to be evaluated. When we found out we had no four amps, we would have to admit we have no four amps. And I mean, I mean, they drilled Antarctica where they knew four amps would come and go. I guess we could argue we could drill the Argentine margin, but it would have been nicer if we could find places with stuff we can burn up in acid. Matt, can, I don't know if there's anything on. Um, and what I didn't show, and there's 15 more slides, is that we see very similar expression in the shallow water Bahamas and um, Maldives. Uh, we see when the southern ocean, the deep ocean circulation spins up, the tropical. Uh, ocean spins up as well and so um, it's kind of a neat story that's what I would have given Monday at this time is that talk but um, I started doing science on my dog walks so <laughs> um, no one Yeah, it usually pulls it up more um, than that, um, Ken. There, there, there is gas deeper down. Don't get me wrong. Um, Good question. I mean, I like to look at the seismics first. I've seen it. I mean, like, would Al here? Yeah, Al's not here. Maybe right Al's there. online. Yeah, Al's online. I'd like to see what he thinks of it because it looks a little potentially like gas. Yeah, I know, but it's raining a good story. Does the gas kind of systematically bunch up in wedges like that? Well, that's the high point. It's going to migrate up. Um, so, um, there is tons of gas. Oh, let me do it here, right in here. So, we lose our reflectors. You can kind of see them, but. Um, well, maybe I think that if that was gas, maybe the BF4 reflector is kind of uh, masking it, but uh, we should expect to have a high amplitude reflector because of the contrast yep. between the acoustic tendons of the gas and the, the overlying sediment, and maybe also a reverse of the polarity. So I guess that can be seen. Yeah, and we, we did look at that. Um, the other thing is, this should just vent right out. These, this upper one should just vent right out to the surface. Um, and it's not clay. It's um, very silty. Um, Catherine. Um, you may have already said this. I came in late. I'm sorry. But what's the composition of the gas and what's the age of the gas? The composition of the... Gas and the age. The gas or the gaps? Oh, I don't know. We haven't stuck a hole in. The, in fact, if there is gas there, we wouldn't be able to drill there. Unless it's dead gas, and that is not under pressure. It's just sitting in. Um, but this ship has precious little mud. So um, if you're drilling, they don't have a lot of ability to stop an overpressure zone. Um, so as Ken or Greg Mountain or others can tell you, the hardest part of getting your proposal drilled is often the safety um, um, committee. And they're not, they're not academic science. Some are, but they come from petroleum industry. They know what gas looks like. Um, you could make a case to drill the one on the left near the surface because you could say it vents, but they would never allow you to drill that transparent zone below VF4 right there. Right, for that reason. For that reason, because it's natural, get, it's biogenic, but it's going to be overpressure. So. We ran into that in um, the North Atlantic on Eric Drift. We just had to move um, our sites few kilometers to the side uh, they didn't get they got approved but not drilled 
Um, maybe I should look at Zoom. James. So, um, was it showing that shortly after the eruption of lavas in Iceland, the climate starts to cool? Is that what uh, it was kind of showing? The thickest pile of lavas on Iceland correlates with the cooling of climate. Yeah, because that's kind of interesting because, I mean, the lavas, I mean, they'll erupt gases, but they're also like these fresh salts that are highly weatherable. So that could also possibly contribute to drawdown of the CO2. Yeah, I mean, you, you got a problem. Well, Iceland is wet. So you got tons of moisture, but you're kind of cold. So I would, I don't know the, it's a good, I agree with you. Um, oh yeah, maybe it won't weather. In as quickly. Climate. Ken, do you know how weatherable basalt at the surface of Iceland is today? Not as weatherable as in places like Borneo, that's why you got here. Right, I, I know. Yeah, everything's in Borneo. I, I actually, my interpretation is the anomaly is the warmth and the return to the cold is just getting back to business as usual. Um, that's my interpretation, but I, I wouldn't rule out. Columbia flood bas River flood basalts are kind of, could be in a zone where you could get some weathering and cooling. But I, I am interested in, in, I mean, they warm abruptly at 17 million years ago. Is there evidence in those, and this is a question for Ben, that you had continued volatile outgassing for two million years? That's how long the cl climate optimum lasted. That's why I thought of Northwest Iceland is because they started erupting 16.4, 16.5, and maybe they, with the biggest kick uh, accumulation after that, maybe there was a little CO2 coming out of that. I, I, I just don't know. Let's see, chat. Maybe, is it okay if I jump in? This is Ben. Yes. Um, I was just going to say one, uh, maybe it was James who was asking, about weathering and i think there's the potential especially for fresh basalt on the steep floor that weathering could be a big factor there um but also that that actually is something i think it's an interesting set of a pair of hypotheses really because that's something we're working pretty actively on is could there be late stages of degassing from the columbia river basalt even as surface volcanism whites. Yeah, but you wouldn't rule out going to Iceland as well, would you? Definitely not. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll go in August or late July. So write the proposal, just put some airfare in for me. I mean, all the work is theirs. I mean, I can't do anything more except for carry carry gear um, but no I, I I changed my talk actually to interest you Ben um, and and your thoughts have gotten me thinking about the mantle plume hypothesis and how it may fit in um, there's the coincidences and timing aren't proof but they certainly require more investigation and the fact that the lower mantle plume activity as far as the excess topography is assumed is when it's warm that would be less um, volcanism and then you know it's out of phase but maybe um, your early volatiles might explain some of that and it, it probably wouldn't take a lot of excess CO2 and volcanism in the early Pliocene but that's a guess I'm just trying to go to Iceland one last time on the government's expense. <laughs> ben, are you raising your hand still or no? Oh, sorry, no, I'll put it down. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to add on just for a note that uh, there is an expedition to drill the Reykjanes 
uh, ridge again, mantle convection and climate. This actually started with some drilling in, during COVID in June to August of 2021, but it, it's on the schedule uh, for next June to August 2023. So stay tuned for the results of that drilling. They're drilling the features that you showed there, the ridges and such. It is interesting, there is major drift accumulation associated just prior to the two biggest volcanic events underneath Iceland. One's drift accumulation from 16 to 19, and then the volcanism, and then from 5 to 3 million years ago, and then the volcanism, as you see in the lava and excess topography. The question is, um, you know, could the warmth come from volatiles prior to the lavas? So, all right. I'm going to stop. Thank you.